Hello and welcome to World Bank Live. I'm Paul Blake in Washington, D.C. And over the next 20 minutes or so, we have a great program lined up for you all about the impact of COVID-19 on migrants and remittances or the cash flows that they send back home. Now, a few months back, I had the chance to talk to Dilip Ratha about the impact or about uh, migrants and remittances for our Expert Answers video series. Here's Dilip back in December. Philip, I want to start by asking, what exactly are remittances and what role do they play in the world of development economics? Remittances are money, small amounts of money that migrants send home to their families and friends, typically for families. And uh, they act as a lifeline to poor households, poor people, as well as poor countries. Now, 2019 was a heady time for remittances. They were on the rise and becoming ever more important in the world of development economics. Here's Dilip Ratho once more. This year, remittances to uh, the developing countries, the poor countries, would be about $550 billion. And at that level, they are on track to exceed foreign direct investment. That is all the money that is going through the multinationals to developing countries. And for about 10 years now, we knew that remittances are more than three times the size of all development aid. But that was then, and since then, so many aspects of our lives have been changed. And that left us wondering, what has been the impact of the pandemic on migrants and remittances? Well, to get an answer to that, we're happy to be joined live by Dilip Ratha here on World Bank Live. Dilip, it's really good to see you again. Let's start with the big question. You and your team have this new report out. Give us the headlines. What do we need to know? Well, remittance flows this year are going to be impacted seriously. They would be down, we expect, by 20%. Uh, that would take the numbers down, the remittance flows to low and middle income countries down from 554 billion last year to about 445 billion this year in 2020. And that is a remittance, uh, wow. that is a lifeline to poor countries. And uh, this rupture of the lifeline to poor countries can have significant impacts on a large number of countries as well as poor people. The human aspect of the decline in the flows is uh, not to be underestimated because when you are talking about large flows like foreign direct investment, it is companies that are sending money. The small sums of money that migrants send, they are in $50, $100, $200 terms. So we are now talking about hundreds of millions, if not a billion people, maybe even more than a billion people getting impacted because of the drop in remittance flows. Let's dig into that a little bit. That's a drop of about 20% there. Is, is that the result of the pandemic itself? Or are there other factors at play here uh, in this 20% drop you're talking about? The main... Uh, impetus for the decline comes from the, the crisis itself, the COVID-19 crisis, the lockdowns, the uh, social distancing, the inability to travel because of travel bans. That has sequestered people wherever they are, and uh, uh, they are not able to send money. But more importantly, uh, yes, it is true that migrants are not going to go back home in large numbers, perhaps, except for internal migrants, as in the case of, let's say, India, we saw that story, or Venezuelans coming from Latin America. But the, the main impact will come from the fact that people are not getting jobs, so migrants are more vulnerable during times of crisis than native-born people, and they will lose jobs or their incomes will fall, so their ability to send money would go down. That is the main impetus. But there are, of course, uh, other uh, spillover effects, so to say, that come from the fact that uh, as the economy, uh, economic activity goes down, then there are more ripple effects, so to say. And I can explain that um, um, in, in a minute. Yeah, with, before that, let's just go back to basics for a second. It may be obvious to some, but, but why is this decline so ex significant? And can you maybe explain for those who it's maybe a little less obvious to the link between migration, remittances, and poverty. Absolutely. The, there are about 270 million international migrants in the world. That's not a lot in some ways, but the, the interesting part is that most of the migrants tend to be in cities and they tend to be concentrated in large cities. So in some cities that might, they might be 
uh, about 25, 40%, even 40% of population. So if you take New York, London, Paris, uh, maybe Mumbai, there is a concentration. But 270 million migrants, international migrants, send money home about 554 billion last year, 445 billion this year. This impact, this is migrants sending money to their families. So for every migrant, maybe there are two, three, four people back home. And when they receive money, they use that for food, for housing, for clothing, for business investment, for sending children to school, for healthcare. And um, people who migrate are mostly young people, poor people, and people are escaping poverty as well as unemployment or underemployment back home. So when they send money home, uh, when they migrate and send money home, it has huge poverty reduction impact. And uh, uh, you, you can imagine that in countries like Nepal, Tajikistan, South Sudan, Somalia, Haiti, remittances are about 30% sometimes 40%, sometimes 50% of national income. In those countries, remittances are actually a lifeline to a large number of households, and especially poor households. If remittances decline, they would fall into poverty. And this time, given the shortage of food and all that is uh, beginning to be felt a bit, the, the impact could be much more severe in terms of also food security issues. So it is it is very important to uh, understand that we are talking about a, a, a lifeline um, of, of finance. Sounds like there's a lot of like interlinking challenges here. Now, we received a question from at Siva Kerella uh, on Instagram asking how the pandemic is affecting migration and labor. And that, that I want to ask you, how has migration been impacted by the pandemic people are, are less able to move freely now. Does that mean the number of migrants themselves has fallen? Not really, um, except in the case of internal migration. And uh, to explain that, migrant stock at any point of time is migrant stock of let's say yesterday, and then new migrants coming in now, and those who return back home. Now that uh, uh, there are travel bans and lockdowns, New migration is definitely going to fall, but also people are not going to go back home. So the stock of migrants, international migrants, will remain more or less uh, unaffected in the near term. Over time, that might change. In the case of internal migration, people are able to go back home, but they are able to walk back home. They are not able to take any public transport because there is no public transport anywhere. No bus services, no train services, no airlines. So people are locked in in wherever they are. So some people are walking back home, as we heard hundreds of millions of people are there as internal migrants in India, and uh, tens of millions are probably uh, have walked back home. But the point is they're not even welcome in their own villages. Villages have barricaded themselves in India against any, anybody from neighboring villages or outside coming in, including their own sons and daughters who are returning from cities because of the fear of the virus. So the stock of migrants is not going to be impacted much in the short term, but um, there will be an impact over a period of six months or a year, because if you are locked out there and don't have a job, then you do want to come back. So people will slowly begin to come back home. Uh, immediately, however, not so much. Let's take a break just there. We've got a lot of people logging on now, so let's take a moment to welcome everyone. We see Aurora in the Philippines, Winnie in Uganda, Farooq in Pakistan, and Shamim in Bangladesh. Hello to them and everyone else out there. If you're just joining us, this is World Bank Live. We're talking to Dilip Ratha, lead economist for remittances here at the World Bank, and he's filling us in on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on migrants and the cash flows they send home or, or what the technical folks call remittances. Dilip, coming back to you now, on Facebook, we got a question from Madlena Puka, and she asks about how different sectors are going to be hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. Some sectors of the economy have been more vulnerable in this outbreak. Are those also the ones that are employing the most migrants? 
they um, in, in different countries the story might play out differently but uh, uh, you have two kinds of migrants and uh, many of us see only one kind maybe not the other kind so right now one kind that is very visible is the the doctors and uh, you know the, the national uh, health services or even the national medical systems and i don't always mean uh, public sector health systems also private sector health systems in many countries uh, have a lot of doctors and nurses who are the heroes right now who are out out there and uh, fighting the fighting for us and um, that sector health sector is definitely uh, doing um, that's not going to sound good like it's an, uh, doing better i mean how can you say that at a time of crisis right um, so health sector is where you see a lot of activity and a lot of migrant activities as well agriculture sector is also in the news because of the seasonality of uh, uh, agricultural season that is just uh, beginning now and uh, uh, there are reports of uh, shortage of farm workers and that has uh, uh, huge implications for the world as a whole in terms of food security because uh, agricultural season uh, is is can be disrupted and uh, food prices are already going up that can be impacted the other part that we see and sometimes we don't see is the the hospitality sector the retail sector the store fronts that those are the other heroes the ones who are running the grocery stores and those who are running the the, the restaurants and um, they have been impacted also there is another sector directly relevant to our purposes here our conversation here that is the money transfer industry money transfer remittance service provision is not considered an essential service and one factor that uh, one tends to forget one when one is engaging with such conversations over it uh, virtually we forget that uh, uh, most of the people in the world do not have access to such it and uh, digital means for sending money home so to say so 80 to 85% of the money sent internationally is cash to cash and we know that cash is not okay now because of also the risk of uh, the virus but poor people informal migrants irregular migrants they go to a store and send money from there the family back home also receives money through that store and both are closed now whether it is a store a remittance service in the us or europe or uh, hong kong or a remittance recipient household uh, or, or a money transfer service working in the philippines or in nepal or in el salvador and that is directly impacting also um, remittance flows because people can't send that money um if uh, you brought up the the food security uh, issue here and the food security challenge also being born out of the covid-19 pandemic for anyone interested in learning more about that we spoke earlier this week to Jurgen Fogele uh, here on World Bank Live you can find that on the World Bank Live website now dilip i want to talk to you about the regional patterns here you know is this effect across the board or are some regions being hit harder than others the um, impact is global Uh, so all regions are going to be impacted and again to put things in perspective a bit the decline in remittance flows this year is going to be historically uh, a record it we have never seen any decline of this kind before since we started monitoring data from the 1980s onwards in 2009 global financial crisis there was a drop in remittances of about 5% but then it bounced back quickly by 2010 remittance flows to low and middle income countries were uh, above the pre crisis level so just to underscore that and and for people who are just tuning in what you're saying today is remittances have dropped 20% amid the covid-19 pandemic compare that to the global financial crisis of 2008 where they dropped just 5% which is a significant drop but relative to today it it looks rather small absolutely absolutely this is unprecedented and that is because the global financial crisis was somewhat localized it 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 we do use the term global there 
but actually it affected a, 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 a few countries much more than the entire world. And it was not a good thing, not to imply that it was a good thing. It, people did suffer. But this crisis is affecting every country in the world. And it is so comprehensive that it is beginning to affect economic activities in remote villages as well, everywhere in the world. So that's the, that's the sort of context in which every part of the world is being impacted. All the regions are being impacted, but then some will be impacted more than the others. And this brings us to uh, the two or three channels. And because of that, we see different impacts. So first, because of the lockdown, social distancing, travel bans, economic activities have fallen because uh, a lot of things have come to a standstill. And that is impacting everyone all over the world. But then oil prices have fallen and oil prices will have an additional impact on oil exporting countries like the Gulf Cooperation countries and Russia. Gulf Cooperation countries and Russia are both large sources of remittance flows to many countries. Gulf countries are sourced to remittance flows to Asia, so South Asia, Southeast Asia, as well as to North Africa in a significant way. And as they begin to face an economic slowdown because of oil price decline, outward remittances from there would be impacted. In case of Russia, you have the oil price uh, issue, but on top of that, the uh, ruble currency of Russia is also weakening against the US dollar. And when money goes from Russia to Central Asian countries like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, in dollar terms, that amount of money would look even smaller. So we are expecting that the largest decline in remittance flows would be about 27% in Europe and Central Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa, which receives remittances from Euro uh, zone, because Euro is weakening against the US dollar as well, they will also suffer quite a bit. That has a decline of 23%. And then in East Asia and Pacific, we are expecting a decline of about 13%. Globally, it's a 20% decline. Philip, stay with me. We have more people tuning in. If you're just joining us, this is World Bank Live. We see a bunch of people tuning in. Hello to Jeannie in Malaysia, Sabita and Anil in Nepal, Lucian and Dina in Egypt, and Sophia in Costa Rica. I know there's a lot more people out there, but hello to everyone. We are talking to Dilip Ratha. He's the lead economist and uh, for migration and remittances at the World Bank. And we're talking about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on remittances and on migrants. Dilip, for those who might just be joining us, the bank is making up to $160 billion available to countries to fight uh, the COVID-19 pandemic over the next 15 months. You have been looking into the uh, impact of COVID-19 on migrants and remittances. Let's talk through some of the solutions and some of the measures that could soften the impact. You've broken down the policy response into three areas. Can you explain that for us? Well, the, the uh, most immediate uh, policy measure that uh, we need is to think that uh, a large number of migrants are also human beings and they are there and they are concentrated in, in, in our community, especially in the urban areas, urban economic centers. And these people as human beings need to be included in our responses to the virus. They should be part of our healthcare responses as well as social protection, cash transfers, uh, access to housing kind of responses. So that is the most important uh, and most urgent policy uh, recommendation. Also, uh, remittance services, remittances sent by these people is uh, a lifeline to a large number of people out there and remittance services have been disrupted during the crisis. So recognizing remittance services as essential services might help open some of these stores and that would facilitate remittance flows. Those, those cash points where people transfer the money from the country they've moved to back to their home country. And you, you were talking about that earlier. Exactly. That is the second important uh, policy uh, message that I would like to convey. And uh, the third area is that we know that uh, uh, Perhaps the only way now for sending money is through digital means, through mobile money, through mobile phones or through internet. And yet we also know that the, the, the poor people 
uh, irregular migrants, those working in informal sector, and that applies to international migrants as well as internal migrants. They are um, actually unbanked, and being banked, having a, access to a bank account is and, and a credit card is often critical to uh, be able to use digital means to send money home, and yet these people don't have access. So there is an urgent need to try to bring these people into the uh, banking sector to make them banked so that they can use digital means. And some of the barriers to bringing these people to the banking sector is, um, is uh, uh, driven by regulation, in particular about know your client requirements, uh, ID checks, and uh, some kind of a suspicion out there that even small amounts of money, $50, $100, uh, often lead to, uh, often can be associated with financial crime or money laundering. Uh, so recognizing that small remittances are not money laundering, at least at this time uh, of crisis, would actually help in terms of financial inclusion going mm -hmm. forward. Can you talk a little bit about stranded migrants? What exactly are stranded migrants, and, and you know what needs to be done to support them? The large number of migrants. Uh, a large number of migrants uh, are not able to move and they have to stay put where they are because of the disruption to public services and they don't have a job. Uh, some of them are actually in, in, in labor camps, um, in, in dormitories and areas where they, 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 they have housing provided by employers. And then there is the side of uh, refugees who are in camps as well. There are refugee camps with millions of people in them. And those places don't always receive the attention that uh, we ought to be paying if we, uh, if we had equivalent number of our own citizens in, in certain places, they would get more care. In other words, migrants are often discriminated against or ignored simply. So they are stranded out there. And uh, in the case of uh, internal migrants, they can go back home if we can help them with public transport. Um, and Origin communities, origin countries, in the case of international migrants, can play an important role in bringing the stranded migrants home and finding quarantine and other ways to bring them, uh, integrate them back into the home communities. So that is one part. But in the meanwhile, when they are in different places, there is a need to provide assistance to them. First, healthcare. Second, cash transfer so they can eat and perhaps uh, uh, even buy soaps. Um, so cash transfer programs should be inclusive of migrants. Then um, housing is important. Uh, running water is important right now. So social protection measures and transportation help is needed. And, and on that, I mean, when it comes to this challenge and the response, health and education and housing services are also a big part of that. Is it difficult to get governments to include migrants in that equation when, when they're planning their response to the coronavirus? Yes, it is. It is indeed sometimes difficult to even be able to reach out to these people. So there are difficulties. So first, uh, you know, there is. This is a related point, and I, I think it ought to be made. Um, large number of migrants are not included in the um, in, in the in the in the government uh, spending plans and uh, government responses in terms of cash transfers because they are foreigners. So there is no, no mechanism to give money to foreigners. And yet there is a need to um, include these people now for selfish reasons, because these are people, they are vulnerable to the virus and they, are, they can also be vectors of uh, the virus. So to protect our own um, health, we need to also take care of these people. And that brings us to the point about discrimination against migrants. That is a general theme that, that has been around for a long time. And it is getting actually stronger in these times when everybody looks like a carrier of uh, a virus and a migrant is more so than somebody who hasn't moved so much. So again, some kind of a, a education program to manage that discrimination, to mitigate the discrimination against migrants is important. But then, more practically, um, simply being able to reach out to people who do not have ID, who do not have proper documentation, who are not in the social registries, 
How do you give them cash? That is a problem. And we need some creative solutions for that. And um, community groups, civil society organizations, church groups, they can be quite helpful in that process. But there has to be a mindset that we need to help them. And just as we wrap up here, one final question for you. Well, you talked about, at the beginning of this program, you talked about there's a drop of 20% in, in remittances globally. Do you view that as a short-term problem or will this pandemic have a lasting impact on migration and, and remittances? We don't yet know the uh, depth of this crisis. And when a cure may be found, that means also the length in terms of duration of this crisis. So there is significant there are significant downside risks to whatever we have said out there, that there is a 20% drop expected in remittance flows. And uh, you know, if the crisis persists, the drop could be larger. Uh, many more migrants may have to go back home. And we know that migrants are essential to the economies, uh, also in the receiving countries. Again, let's think about the hospitals and the agriculture sector and the restaurant business and the construction sector and the domestic health sector. Migrants are critical to the functioning of many, many economies out there, both those who receive migrants and those who send migrants. So if the crisis continues for longer, there are downside risks. And what we must not do, something that is within our control, is in our response to the crisis, let's not put short-term measures, measures like um, movement control, visa policy control, that may be difficult to take away later on. That kind of uh, uh, responses that might leave a permanent um, dent in the structure, that should be avoided. We have, to be, we have to be careful that if we are doing something in, in keeping in mind the short-term response, let's make sure that it remains short-term, that it is not going to have a structural uh, persistence in the future for two, three, four, five, or 10 years. And then it begins to damage all of us. Because one thing that the crisis has brought to, to the fore is the global connectedness of all of us. National borders don't keep away viruses. That's what we have learned. So we are one people, and we have to take care of all the people together. Dilip, thank you so much for your time. This has been really fascinating and informative. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you. All, all the people at home for joining us here on World Bank Live. If you want to learn more about the World Bank and its response to the COVID-19 pandemic, head on over to worldbank.org forward slash coronavirus and check out our previous episode of Expert Answers with Dilip. That's available on the World Bank's YouTube page. And next week on Tuesday, we're speaking to Dilip's colleague, Mihal Rutkowski, about the importance of social protections amid this ongoing crisis right here on World Bank Live and all World Bank's uh, major social media platforms. In the meantime, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.